Our first panelist, Binu Yakimar. She will be discussing the topic of green jobs. Binu comes from, to, to us from Pemba Institute where she is the director of the Pembina's electricity program. Prior to joining Pembina, Binu worked with the Transalta Renewable Generation. Binu has traveled the world, working as a consultant to the Guyanan government, addressing systemic issues with government efficiencies, citizen empowerment, and conducting research with Defence Research and Development Canada. And also working with the Alstom Power in Switzerland. Binu. Thanks, Mike. Like bringing back memories <laughs> a while ago. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, I feel really honored to be here. Thanks for having me. And I have to say, this is the first time I've sat in a panel with just women speakers. So way to go, AFL. Yeah. Definitely. Um, yeah, uh, maybe the other shout out I also want to give out is for the extremely long registration form that you had. I have never seen so much attention to detail and the meeting the needs of very different people. Like, I really respect that. I think this convention is one of the most inclusive events I've been to. And I'm like taking notes for Pemina <laughs> to improve our uh, events. So thank you for setting the bar so high. Um, yeah, so I'll start with a bit about uh, the Pemina Institute. Maybe some of you know us. We're a nonprofit organization. We work on clean energy issues across Canada. And my team specifically works on renewables, energy efficiency, and economic diversification issues. Um, yeah, uh, the way we do our work is we, we do research. Yeah, I think a lot of people know us from the writing that we do, but we also do a lot of advocacy and convening events. Maybe not as good as the AFLs, but <laughs> uh, they're a bit more geeky. Uh, <laughs> speaking of geeky, I'll start with the graph. <laughs> uh, so. Uh, for today, I, what I was thinking I'd do is uh, go through some of the trends that are happening in the energy sector that are coming our way, um, talk a little bit about what that means to the labor movement, and then talk about how labor can actually take a leading role in that and uh, in actually shaping the changes that are coming our way. So what this graph shows is uh, investment trends across the world. And as you can see, the second line there that's kind of short is the fossil fuel investment, and that's just uh, plateauing out, and the red line is investment in renewables, and that's been taking off in a big way. And it's not surprising, it's happening because of low price of natural gas, uh, solar, wind costs are coming down, um, a lot of jurisdictions are investing in energy efficiency, um, there's regulatory requirements on environmental performance, there's climate policies, all of these are driving down investments in fossil fuels. And what this means is you're actually seeing jobs, and I know this is not news to anyone, but jobs in the oil and gas sector, the coal sector coming down. And when you look at the numbers in the states, what you see is right now there are more jobs in solar in the US than there is in oil and gas or coal. So that's that blue line that's uh, climbing up there. Uh, just to give you a bit of perspective, so in the states, uh, for the first half of 2016, they retired 6.5 gigawatts of coal plants. That's more than the coal we have in all of Alberta, retired within six months. Um, so if you look at it in Alberta's context, what does this mean? So we're gonna be retiring about six gigawatts of coal over 13 years, so we have a more general trend there. And obviously this is gonna mean this, that there are gonna be jobs that are lost. And so we're looking at about 3,000 jobs that'll be coming offline over the next decade or so, but at the same time, and so that's the gray bars that you see here, um, but at the same time, you're gonna see an improvement in renewables and energy efficiency. So I said, you know, we've got six gigawatts of coal coming offline. On the other hand, you're gonna see between five to seven gigawatts of renewables coming online at the same time. And if the government does its job right in terms of rolling out energy efficiency programs, it can actually create a thriving energy efficiency industry here. And that comes with jobs too. That, so that's the orange bars there. And what you'll see um, is you can actually create more jobs than you lose if you do um, a good job in terms of your energy transition. Um, so I, uh, I, I do know this is not a walk in the park. It's not rainbows and unicorns. Um, it, it's gonna be a tough journey and we're gonna have to put a lot of support and planning into the transition. And what I thought I'd do today is, there is a lot of coal plants that are coming offline in the US. Um, 
a lot for just economic reasons, and there are things we can learn from there. So I'm going to share a few examples with you folks and see how it lands. Um, so one of the things I wanted to share was this POWER initiative. It stands for Partnerships for Opportunity and Workforce and Economic Revitalization. Mouthful. Um, but this is a federal fund coming from, this was started by the Obama administration. And the idea was uh, communities that are affected by coal transition can apply for this fund. Um, and they have to make a case for it. So in eastern Kentucky, what they've seen is they're using this fund to retrain laid off coal miners in energy efficiency. So these coal miners are now going around doing energy efficiency audits. Um, they're doing retrofits. Um, in Campbell County in Tennessee, this is kind of interesting, they're actually using that money to buy a huge chunk of land that they're going to turn into an industrial park to attract businesses into their county. Um, at the same time, they are also setting aside a chunk of that money to do a feasibility analysis to see how they can bring high-speed internet to the county, again, to bring in more businesses there. Um, another initiative they're doing, and this is another acronym, RECLAIM. I'll let you read that out. I, I don't know. I think they must have some intern whose full-time job is to like come up with these cute acronyms. Um, but yeah, so it's to revitalize uh, the economy of coal communities by leveraging local activities. So this is actually a, a bill that's in front of Congress right now, um, and they're debating it. And what this would do is, um, so they have a abandoned mines land fund uh, that coal companies put money into so to allow for reclamation to happen at the end of the life of the coal plants. And so this act will require those funds to be actually spent uh, in an accelerated manner. So to be spent earlier so that you actually do more reclamation ahead of time as coal plants are coming offline. So that's mainly to create jobs um, and to allow uh, coal workers to actually work on the reclamation side of it. And at the same time, they're also trying to be creative around how they're rec reclaiming it and making sure that it actually creates infrastructure and space for more businesses to happen. Um, so, okay, these might sound cool, but they're not that great. And you know, we're on a dream bigger panel, so I actually want to throw something at you that might be, uh, might actually change our system. So you know, I'd say, you know, uh, as a labor movement, or even as environmental organizations, we can try and react to the trends that are coming, and that's what the two options I told you about are. They're reacting to things that are happening. But what can we do to actually set the trends ourselves? Like, how do we get ahead of that? And I think we can start thinking about some of the issues we have in the current energy system um, and see how we can address them. So one of the things I wanted to bring up is the energy industry is notorious for gender inequality. I think, I don't have to tell people in the room this. Um, so there's only 20% of the people, less than 20% of the people employed are women. Uh, the gender wage gap is over 30%. Um, so we have to think about when we're creating this new industry, what can we do to create better jobs and better pay for women. And just as an example, um, I mean, there's creative opportunities, right? So this new energy efficiency program that the government is rolling out, it requires energy assessors to come to your house. And actually, seniors have gotten pretty anxious about this because they don't want to have strangers coming into their house in the middle of the day. Same thing with moms who are in their house in the uh, daytime. Um, they're a bit nervous about this. So I was thinking, what if you actually had a group of women who provided these services? And, you know, and so moms actually feel a little bit more comfortable having women in their house in the daytime. So I think there's a lot more options that are going to open up. A lot of these jobs are not going to be in remote places. They're going to be closer to our homes. And it makes it better uh, for women to participate. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about was workers' capital. I know um, Alberta isn't there yet, but we do have pension funds for our workers. And maybe we don't have as much control as we would like to. Uh, and I know Trying. people in the room are working on <laughs> yep. it, so yep. that's fantastic. Um, but in the States, um, they are using this, these pension funds to actually invest in their own future. So rather than putting it into somebody's insurance uh, company, they're actually investing in clean, uh, clean energy industry so that they create jobs for the workers as they get transitioned. Um, Maybe another thing to think about is uh, union cooperatives. So, and this is a thing that's happening in a big way in the States, and I know it hasn't picked up here in Alberta yet, uh, but they do have uh, folks who have uh, employee shared ownership plans already with some companies, and so it's not that much harder for them to transition that into something that's actually owned by worker cooperatives. And you know, like to me, the big dream question for you guys is like, what would it take for that to happen in Alberta? For 
for workers to have a bigger role in decision making in how capital is set aside, how the energy industry develops. Um, and maybe the last point I would make is around uh, broader coalitions. So there is a need, um, I'm not sure if you guys have already addressed this in the convention, but like to go beyond the labor movement and reach out to community groups, people who are working on poverty re reduction initiatives, to environmental groups. Um, there's a lot of work that needs to be done in, at the grassroots level, at the community level, where transition is gonna hit the ground hard. Um, and and you, there's a need for these broad coalitions. So I would say, you know, the work ahead of us is not easy. There, there is a lot of grassroots level difficult work that needs to be done. There's a lot of policy level work that needs to be done at the uh, federal government. But I would say that it's worthwhile because by putting in this effort, we actually give a chance to shape a new industry, shape the labor movement to be more sustainable, um, to be more equitable. So that makes me excited. <laughs> yeah. That's great. Thanks to you, Binu, and thanks to Pamela.